Welcome to the MSFS Global Challenges Series. My name is Nicole Bibin Sadaka. I'm the Deputy Director of the MSFS Program. Our topic this week is democracy, governance, and human rights. I was fortunate to be able to sit down with three fascinating practitioners and thought leaders. First, with Dr. Kevin Casas Zamora, who serves as the Secretary General of International IDEA, an international organization working to promote and support democracy around the world. I then also sat down in a joint interview with Fariha Aziz, an award-winning journalist and the founder of Bolo Bai, a digital rights NGO in Pakistan, and Abele Akobi, Facebook's director of public policy for the Middle East, Africa, and Turkey. I'm certain you will find the interviews as engaging to watch as I did to sit down with these experts. I am so delighted to welcome to our conversation today, Dr. Kevin Casas Zamora, who serves as the Secretary General of International IDEA, a position that he's held since August 2019. International IDEA is one of the leading international organizations working on electoral processes, constitution building, political participation and representation, and really bringing citizens into the conversation to bring democratic change around the world. Dr. Casa Zamora comes to us with a distinguished history and professional um, experience, having served in his country, Costa Rica's um, government as the second vice president and minister of national planning. He served in the Organization of American States as the secretary for political affairs. He has served at the United Nations Development Program um, human, uh, as the national coordinator for human uh, development report. He is currently a fellow at the Brookings Institution and at the Inter-American Dialogue, excuse me, and served previously as a fellow at the Brookings Institution. And most importantly, he has taught at Georgetown. So we are welcoming him back um, to at least the virtual hilltop until we can welcome him back in person um, to, to the hilltop. But it's just really wonderful to have you, uh, Kevin, because uh, you, have had, you have such a distinguished history and you are part of our community. Um, and such an important person to have as part of our conversation today, specifically on how COVID is impacting democracy and governance around the world. So welcome to our conversation. Well, thanks for having me, uh, Nicole. It's a, it's a real joy. And yeah, I'm a, I'm a Hoya at heart. Uh, I taught uh, at Georgetown when I was living in DC, so I have a soft spot for, for Georgetown. Wonderful. It's, it's great Wonderful. to be here. Excellent. Thank you for taking the time. Let's start with what the world looked like pre-COVID. It's almost hard to remember, but how would you characterize the state of democracy um, globally before the pandemic? What were the greatest challenges? What were the, what were the areas of progress? What was I, International IDEA and your organization focused on at that point? Sure. Um, it was a, big of a, a bit of a mixed bag. Um, in, and when I when I say a mixed bag, that means that uh, there's probably a little bit of dissonance between the doom and gloom that we have become uh, used to when it comes to discussing democracy over the past few years and what's really happening out there. Uh, there are certainly many challenges uh, made more acute by, by the pandemic, but there are a lot of interesting things and good things uh, happening out there. And I'll give you, I'll give you a sense of, a, of, of this mixed picture. Um, when you see the sheer number of democracies in the, in the world, it, it continues to grow. Mm -hmm. um, we did this exercise as part of our flagship publication, which is a, a report that we call the Global State of Democracy Report, which we put out every two years. Last November, we launched the, the, second, the second edition of this report. So, and it's really a, a, a kind of global health check on, on democracy. And what we found was that a, given a certain basic definition of, of democracy, and we can talk a little bit about that because there, there are all sorts of methodological intricacies and, and, and other details, 
but a, we had 90 democracies in the world back in 2010. By 2018, a, we had 97. Mm -hmm. So the, the democracy continues to spread its, its, its wings a, mm -hmm. a, all over the world. A, why is that? Well, because despite all the doom and gloom, uh, interesting things are and positive things are happening in a, in a number of unlikely places, quite frankly. I mean, uh, who would have thought uh, three or four years ago that you would have a democratic transition, an uneven transition, an uncertain transition in a place like Myanmar? Mm. Who would have thought that we would have a, a political a opening in a very significant one a, over the past two years in a place like Sudan. Who would have thought that we would have a, again, a, a, a tentative political opening, but a very important one nonetheless in a place like Ethiopia. So you, when you add all those cases, when you add Burkina, Burkina Faso, when you add Malaysia, when you have, you know, there are different democratic experiments popping up in different places, and that's often missed mm -hmm. in the in the in the headlines. So that's the good part, and and, and not just that. Actually, uh, there's also, and we did this exercise in our in our report when you when you classify political regimes in the world into democracies, non-democracies, and this kind of neither here nor there category called hybrid regimes, and you, and you run a few tabulations on how the different kinds of regimes correlate with truly critical a development outcomes, it, it, it becomes very clear that democracies tend to do much better than hybrid regimes and authoritarian regimes when it comes to issues as fundamental as women's rights, to issues as fundamental, and, and this is remarkable, a, a, you know, given the, the, the bad rap that democracies get when it comes to corruption, they tend to be much better when it comes to corruption than hybrid regimes and authoritarian regimes. And here I'd like to single out in particular the question of women's rights, because it, it, we all know, because we know that if the world stands any chance of achieving the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goals, that runs through empowering women, through securing women's rights. So there you have a very interesting and powerful connection. So it, it, there is a connection between sustainable development and democracy, and it runs to a very significant degree through women's rights. So if for, for development, democracy is a good thing. Now, the challenges, and there are a plenty, because it, it, you know, it's no myth that democracy has been encountering uh, headwinds over the past few years. Well, the good news is that we have more democracies. The bad news is that the quality of democracies is a declining across the board. And when I mean across the board, I mean across different attributes of democracy. Mm. And I mean that it's declining across all sorts of democracies, young democracies, as well as established democracies, wealthy democracies, as well as developing democracies. The challenges the democratic systems are facing these days are global in nature. And I'll give you just a, 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 
a nugget of information that conveys the point well. I mean, when you, when, and again, this comes from our report, when you take the really serious cases of what we call democratic backsliding, which is it, the kind of situation when you have a deliberate erosion of uh, democratic norms, often uh, set in motion by, the, by, by governments that were democratically elected, right? Uh, when, when you take those cases of serious democratic backsliding, um, there, at the moment when we put out the report, there were 10 particularly conspicuous cases. Well, it so happens that six of those 10 are uh, European countries, including mm. uh, members of the European Union. Uh, so, I mean, that tells you that you know, that old trope that, oh, well, yeah, you know, democracy has challenges, but that's mostly for poor countries, you know, poor democracies and young democracies. It's not true anymore. Right. So this is a, this is a very important thing. And then, you know, I could, I could mention a whole bunch of other things. I mean, the, the, the trends that we were seeing before the pandemic uh, in the erosion of the civic space, including the erosion of basic tenets a, a, a connected to freedom of expression, a, a freedom of the press that was under stress in a, in, in a great many countries. Yeah. To one, one piece of information with this, I, 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 I finished this, uh, this introduction, which I find particularly uh, dispiriting, which is the following. When you it, when you look at the proportion of countries that, uh, according to different uh, measures, are experiencing high levels of corruption, mm -hmm. and you actually it, it, it look at the data as we did for all these indicators, I mean, we used an enormous amount of data, it, going back to 1975, when you look at that proportion of countries with high levels of corruption, Nicole, it hasn't changed one bit. The world is flatlining when it comes to corruption, when it, it, which I find incredible given the amount of resources, the amount of thinking, the amount of efforts, the amount of activism that has gone into this. I mean, that speaks to the intractability of the of the problem and of course as we know corruption is one of the most important challenges democracies of all kinds are facing everywhere so that gives you a sort of a, a, a sense of where we were before <laughs> the pandemic struck and uh, the the pandemic it has posed its own set of challenges but it, it is against this backdrop yeah that is an extraordinarily helpful introduction because it does paint the picture of um, where were we when COVID entered the scene? So let's turn to that. And I would love to hear your thoughts on how has the pandemic impacted the global landscape? Um, has the impact been felt most acutely by the health crisis itself or other related factors? The economic downturn, the lack of mobility, um, and, and how has that played in potentially differently in um, more mature democracies versus countries that um, were struggling with either hybrid or authoritarian governments? The, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the first thing that I would like to say about this is that the political fallout uh, from, from COVID is, is yet to be determined. I mean, it is, it is early days, I'm yep. afraid. Uh, you know, this is a, a this is like a, a cascade of crisis that we'll go through over the next uh, few years. Um, uh, and, you know, with that, uh, you know, caveat in, in mind, uh, there are things that, that we already already know. I mean, we already know, for instance, that 
a, a very significant proportion of democracies all over the world have invoked emergency powers to deal with the pandemic. Uh, this is, for starters, and this is very important, this is a legitimate part of the arsenal that any democratic system uh, has in the face of extraordinary circumstances as, as we are uh, going through. Mm -hmm. So th th there's nothing inherently wrong about that. You know, in actual fact, you can almost say that countries, uh, democratic countries have a, two different constitutions. I mean, they, they have a, a longer, more detailed constitution for normal times, and they have a smaller constitution with a set of rules for, for really grave emergencies. So, so there's nothing inherently wrong in, in, in that. Um, the thing is that those emergency powers, in order to be compatible with democratic tenets, need to be exercised in a certain kind of way. I mean, they need to be a, a subject to oversight a, by legislatures and, and judges. They have to be temporary. They have to be a, connected a, to the nature of the emergency. Uh, and as long as you do, I just, uh, as long as you respect those, those, uh, those limits, uh, mm -hmm. there's no democratic transgression, as it were. The problem is that we are seeing in quite a few places a, a measures being adopted that are kind of difficult to justify for the sake of fighting against the pandemic. I mean, and I'll give you an example. I mean, there are 50 plus countries, uh, the majority of them uh, authoritarian or hybrid regimes, but many democracies, mm. uh, over 25, 26 democracies that have adopted measures to restrict the freedom of the press, for mm. instance. Because of COVID. Which, because of COVID, which I find, which I find it, 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 it's very difficult to make a case for that. In actual fact, one would think that a, citizens need as much information, hopefully accurate, mm -hmm. as possible yeah. to deal with the pandemic and to make informed decisions. So whenever I see that, I raise my eyebrow, Nicole. I mean, I, uh, it's almost certain that a government that chooses to restrict uh, the freedom of the press in this kind of situation uh, has some kind of authoritarian inclination uh, uh, underpinning its actions. Mm -hmm. So this is this is a major concern, and, and I would I would like to to extend that a little bit because even in cases where where you see uh, which are the majority, by the way, where you see that emergency powers are being exercised correctly, I have the nagging concern, Nicole, that a uh, they may well become the new normal for democratic systems. And that we as citizens become numb to uh, intrusions of, you know, in, our, in, in, in the sphere of our, of our privacy, that we become immune to, a, to many a, measures taken by governments that impinge on the exercise of basic freedoms and uh, and that in a way uh, this emergency powers become the norm not so much because authoritarian rulers demand those powers but because uh, fearful citizens uh, tolerate it right uh, so this is a this is a big concern and i would add uh, to this another two concerns very briefly i mean the, the, the second area of concern, and, and, and I'm sure you would want to ask me more about this, is the question of elections. 
Yes. I mean, how a, the pandemic is affecting a, this decision of whether to hold or to postpone elections, and if you do hold elections, how you go about it. That's one area of concern, which can be very serious because in, in many countries, elections uh, are often the, uh, the most important, even the only safety valve that highly polarized systems that are under considerable stress because of the pandemic, uh, you know, they, 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 they are the only safety valve that, that uh, many political systems have. And the third area of concern, and this is one that I find particularly, particularly uh, ominous, is connected to the political ramifications of the mammoth economic crisis that we are seeing globally. Right. Uh, and this is, mer this is merely in its early stages. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very concerned about what can happen politically as a result of the economic crisis in 2021 and, and, and beyond. I think it's to be expected that that will create a lot of political instability, even a very significant public order problem in many places with riots and, and all sorts of things. Uh, so this is, this is something that we have to be very, uh, very vigilant about. Yeah. Let me go back to the to the, your previous point, and then we'll come back to the economic point. Um, the issue of elections is um, is a highly uh, visible and a highly important one. And and International Idea has reported that seventy countries um, since February have postponed or canceled elect elections because of COVID. How do you go about assessing when those um, cancellations or postponements are a reflection of a legitimate health concern or a legitimate um, administrative concern, which is actually serving the people better by leading them to a delayed but a free and fair election? And how can you discern when it is um, a sign of an authoritarian or an undemocratic um, step? Because that distinction is, is essential for us to not undermine the good intentions of, of well but at the same time to be able to combat those government's a actions that are that are problematic. Well, it, it, it depends on the situation. It's not a it's not an easy decision for most countries to uh, to make. I mean, whether to hold the election or or to postpone it. I mean, a, a, there are there are pros and cons. A, 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 whichever way you you go. Um, there are a few telltale signs, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the lessons that we've learned over the past few months is that uh, if you look at cases where elections were held successfully, uh, in, in the sense that there was not you know, major disruption, that the outcome was perceived as legitimate, that people could participate in, in, in adequate numbers. And in, in some cases, even, you know, thinking here about South Korea, I mean, they, they had elections uh, two or three months ago, national elections, and the turnout was the highest it had been in, in 30 years. I mean, when you see those cases, one of the uh, of the common elements to these stories is that whatever measures were adopted in order to hold elections, whether the elections were held when they were scheduled or whether they were postponed, those measures were supported by a very broad political consensus. Mm -hmm. That's critical. That's critical. Um, that's a, to me. I mean, when 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 the incumbent typically rams through the a, down the throat of the opposition a new set of electoral procedures mm -hmm. or or a, a, a new electoral calendar, a, 
you can almost be sure. Number one, that they're playing fast and loose with the democratic process and that there will be problems down the, down the line. Yeah. Uh, and I guess this, this point about, about political consensus, uh, uh, I'm afraid it's particularly relevant uh, uh, given what's happening in the US right now. Uh, if this is one of the keys to a successful uh, election uh, held during a pandemic, uh, well, it, you guys better start working very hard on building that consensus rapidly uh, in conditions of very high polarization and, and it's, it's, it's not easy. Then you have other elements that are very important to, to take into account. I mean, I guess uh, there are, uh, one of the issues that has come to the fore as a result of the, of the pandemic is the whole question about special voting arrangements, what they're called special voting arrangements, which is a generic term for different kinds of e-voting, different uh, modalities of mailing voting, uh, measures uh, uh, conceived to extend the time when people can go to the polls and, and cast their vote. Uh, all those measures, mm -hmm. which are meant to facilitate, to provide different alternatives to voters to cast their, their vote, it, they're they discussed under the rubric of uh, special voting arrangements. Obviously, uh, some countries and some electoral authorities have uh, more options than, than others. I mean, in South Korea, they were very, very successful in, in making sure that there was a, a, a plethora of options for voters to cast their vote. And why is this important? Well, obviously, because it, you don't want in the in the in the middle of a pandemic, you don't want a, a, a to the extent possible a, people coming in great numbers to the a, to whatever they're supposed <laughs> to cast their vote at the same time, because I mean that's that creates public health risk. So you have either to spread the the inflow of people to cast their vote in person or to give them the possibility uh, to cast their vote in other ways that don't imply going to the uh, to the voting uh, uh, precinct mm -hmm. so uh, in south korea they could do this very well because you know it's a wealthy country and they 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 have the the laws in place that allow for special voting arrangements to be part of the political process of the electoral process and that's not true in every country right. i mean and here i'm thinking you know I, I come from latin america i mean in latin america eh, i mean think about mailing voting eh, well eh, as strange as it sounds for anyone that comes from a developed country eh, a, 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 a postal service worthy of the name is a very exotic thing. Let's put it this way in Latin America. So that's not really an option. Right. On the contrary, other pretty basic measures such as extending the time when people can go in person and cast their vote instead of voting everybody in one day, allowing you know, for people to cast their vote uh, along several days. I mean, that's within the reach of almost any election management body in the world. Um, so, it, so this is, I mean, the whole question of the special voting arrangements is an important one. And, and number three, and, and here is another thing that the Koreans did remarkably well. And again, this is something that is, generally speaking, within the reach of any election management body, they were exceptionally good at communicating clearly yes. their decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, their decisions of two types, 
they were very good at communicating the safety measures that they had adopted mm. so as to reduce the the risk of contagion for people that decided to vote in person mm -hmm. and they were very good at communicating the availability of other ways to cast your vote it, they were exceptionally uh, adroit in 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 communicating their decisions. And again, I mean, this is something that most election management bodies can, can do if they set their, their mind to it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is teaching really interesting lessons. I mean, and as in many other things, Nicole, I think a lot of the changes we're seeing in, 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 in electoral processes uh, will be here to stay. Yeah. And what I'm hearing from you is changes in operations or procedures are not necessarily the problem, provided that they actually come with just a lot more of what we see in democracies anyway, more transparency, more inclusiveness. Changes are not necessarily the problem because of the pandemic, but they okay. should always be characterized by more democratic procedures and more democratic characteristics. Well, I mean, and, 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 and Nicole, and, and Nicole, I mean, one, you're talking about transparency. Well, I mean, one of the critical elements of transparency uh, if, when making this decision as to whether to hold or not elections, if you're going to postpone an election, at least, you know, have a sense of when the election will take place. I mean, you cannot simply postpone the election and, and, and go away and, and, and that's the end of the of the problem. Right. Um, let me return to the, sure. e the economic question. Um, so returning to the economic question, walk me through what your concerns are looking forward about how the economic downturn that many countries are feeling because of COVID will impact democratization in the future. Obviously, we don't know exactly where, when COVID will end or what will come, but I do think that we're headed for years of economic downturn or years of economic challenges. And what do we expect that that will mean for the democracy community? There are, there are a few different angles to this. And it, there are negative angles and somewhat surprisingly, there are positive angles to this as well. And, and it's important not to lose sight of those. I mean, among the negative angles, a, a, Again, I mean, I, I, I'm very concerned with the, uh, the prospect of a massive economic downturn and, and a massive increase in unemployment. It, Nicole, I mean, there are so many historical examples of this. I mean, of the, of the, of the havoc that unemployment can wreak on, on, on any political system. Uh, my concern is that that has an enormous potential to create a political instability, mm -hmm. to give a boost to different kinds of political options and discourses that basically say, this is this guys that you're going through is the proof that the political system that we have a, has to be torched. And so, this has the potential to give a boost to anti-system uh, discourse uh, and, and, and political, uh, political options. Um, so, and as I said, I mean, the, the, the even more practical uh, risk here is that there might be very serious public order problems uh, that emerge in many, in many countries. I mean, from large-scale demonstrations, I mean, and, and that is not necessarily a public order problem, but more serious things. I mean, the a, a, a riots in particular, a looting, that sort of thing. It, it, and, the, and the danger here is that that's the kind of situation that provides an extra motive to invoke to continue invoking emergency powers. So we go back to this issue that emergency powers risk becoming the new normal. And in, in places, and again, you know, I, I go back 
to the to the experience of my region in the world, you know, Latin America, if we get into that sort of large scale public order problem as a result of the economic crisis, eh, I always fear the the prospect of a that kind of situation creating a temptation to enlarge the internal role of the military, uh, which in the case of Latin America has a less than illustrious political uh, history. So uh, that's, uh, that's a real risk. Now, the, the, the positive bit, and here, you know, this is, this is something that I would like to, to emphasize a lot. I mean, in, I don't think that in, in every country, but at least in a few countries, I would like to think, hopefully many, the very magnitude of the disruption, the very magnitude of the crisis may well create a, an, a, a may well create an opportunity to go back to the drawing board and renegotiate the social contract, mm -hmm. which in many countries, I mean, we are seeing is totally ripped apart. It's totally broken. Uh, because if there's one thing that this pandemic has done is uh, showing the fault lines that are crisscrossing our our societies. I mean, the social fault lines, the economic fault lines, the political fault lines. Uh, you know, and, and it's, it's just so obvious how, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the virus might not be human made, but the consequences oh. and the patterns of the dissemination of the virus are human made. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. So, I would like to think that at least in a few countries, we're going to see a wide ranging processes of political and social dialogue leading to new constitutions, to new social pacts, social and political pacts of the kind that often emerge as a result of, of a, a post authoritarian transition or as a result of a post-conflict uh, political settlement. Uh, I would like to think that at least in a few countries this, this can happen. You know, a, a, a great catastrophes often lead to, to a new political equilibrium. And, uh, you know, that's what happened in, in, I'm thinking here, you know, Western Europe. I mean, Western Europe, emerging with a new political order from the ashes of the Second World War. Uh, Spain, which is a country that is very close to Latin America in many ways, uh, emerging with a new political settlement as a result of the democratic transition. I mean, that kind of thing. And, do you and, see that emerging from singularly internally in countries, or do you see that also uh, driven to some extent from an external source, whether it is a, a non-governmental organization, an international organization, or um, an external actor, whether that could be Spain and Latin America, or it could, you know, a, 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 an external actor that has significant influence on a country. My impression is that it has to come from within. I mean, international actors you know can and should and here i'm thinking about international idea for for one i mean we we should try to nudge countries uh, towards dialogue because i mean the alternative to dialogue is is terrible the alternative to dialogue is that the issues that are coming to the fore in this pandemic will be settled through violence mm -hmm. and through political uh, authoritarianism uh, which, by the way, is entirely possible as well. I mean, it's what happened in many countries, in a great many countries, during and immediately after the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. So both outcomes have historical precedents. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, we can try to nudge countries towards positive dialogue. We can facilitate information as to what other countries are doing, uh, what is working and what is not working in terms of renegotiating the social contract and setting in motion this dialogue uh, processes. Uh, that's the role that we can that we can play. And also, I have to say, uh, we have to keep nagging everybody with the notion that we should not lose sight of the risk that this pandemic poses for democracy. I mean, that is right and, and proper that we pay attention to the public health emergency, but there's a risk for democracy and we have to be mindful every day that there's a risk. And so we have to, you know, keep reminding everybody that, that uh, we should not allow democracy to become a casualty of the virus. Well stated, well stated. Um, let me then take it to the global world order conversation. And long before the pandemic began, there was a conversation about um, what is happening in the international global system, whether the liberal world order was over, whether democracy was declining enough that it would no longer be the foundational uh, governing system, or at least a set of values underpinning the international global system. Um, how do you see that as you're talking about democracy being at risk of being a casualty of the pandemic? How are you seeing democratic values as part of the international system? Are they also at risk uh, um, of being a casualty of the pandemic? Oh, they are. Oh, they are. They are. I think that does 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 this one part of the this discussion about the political impact of COVID that has to do with geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And uh, and here, I would like to go back a little bit in, in, in history. I mean, it, it is seldom said that one of the reasons for the irresistible expansion of democracy over the past 50, 60 years in the world it is connected to the fact that the single most important and influential political actor in the world, namely the United States, is a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's as simple as that. And mind you, you know, and, and a, a democracy that in, in many instances has exhibited a kind of crusading attitude towards a, a exporting democracy, you know, which a lot of countries found many, you know, very irritating and very pesky, but it had a lot of good consequences too. And of course, you know, this story is, uh, you know, is riddled with inconsistencies and hypocrisies of different kinds, but all in all, all in all, uh, I think the, 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 the influence of the United States is a crucial, crucial element in this process of global expansion of democracy. Mm -hmm. um, why is this important? Because uh, one of my, of my great fears in all of this is that, uh, and I'll be here, you know, I'll be very blunt here. I mean, the, the, the shambolic, the shambolic, a uh, the shambolic way in which the 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 U.S. government, particularly at the federal level, I mean, uh, has has met the challenges of uh, posed by COVID, it uh, has had an immense cost for the U.S. in terms uh, of its soft power. Mm. And the power of its example. And a, one of my biggest fears in all of this is that one fine day, a, not too 
distant from now, uh, I'm not saying that it's a certainty, but there's a possibility that we might wake up in a world where the single most important and influential geopolitical actor is no longer a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. Is is China uh, to cut to the chase, and uh, and and at that moment, the the effort to expand the democratic creed in the world it becomes an uphill struggle, yeah. uh, and we might be in for for a twilight struggle, for a twilight struggle. Uh, to protect democracy because the geopolitics uh, that allowed for the expansion of democracy might well change in a dramatic way over the next few years as a res uh, partly not entirely but partly as a result of of this pandemic what other actors do you see emerging or existing on the international stage that could play that role if the united states is not the the country that does or if the united states recedes or is not the singular leader of that are there other countries are there other organization no. are there non governmental or corporate entities that take that role i mean it nicole we go back to the to the discussion that we've been having for years only a only in a more pressing way now. I mean, I, I, I don't think that any twilight struggle to protect democracy can do without the US. Mm -hmm. So the US continues to be indispensable. Uh, but I think that this twilight struggle is only possible if, and this is, this is practical implications for, for, for now. We need to create a sort of global network to protect democracy. It's a global network of governments committed to the cause of democracy. And I'm, I'm doing this interview uh, in Sweden that not long ago, last year, decided that one of the pillars of its foreign policy will be henceforth a, the defense of democracy. A, I'm talking about a country like Canada mm. that not long ago, Krista Freeland, who until recently was the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, a, was given an interview to the Financial Times saying that the single most important a, struggle, cost, for the world in the next few decades is about protecting democracy. So, I mean, you have to create a, a, a global network of like-minded governments mm -hmm. a, across all regions of the world willing to take up this struggle, mm -hmm. but not just governments. I mean, you need to enlist in this effort a international organization such as IDEA, mm -hmm. that all the different actors that operate in the pro-democracy, democracy promotion, democracy advancement a ecosystem, you need to enlist civil society, a, but you need to create this kind of global effort, global conscious, deliberate effort to protect democracy against the onslaught of authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. it, it, will, it will take a lot. That's a great challenge though, to take up. Um, it is the challenge I think of our time and it's a great challenge that we're not only taking up for our generation, but obviously handing to the next generation as a challenge for them Indeed. to take up because um, just as those who came before us at the end of the Second World War uh, realized that a global order um, based on shared values, based on an understanding of a universal set of human rights, based on um, a collaborative international system, knew that they would emerge out of 
um, tremendous destruction into prosperity because of those values. I think we are again at a pivot point where we are having these conversations and it will be a That's generational um, a general effort. Um, well, we, we could continue this conversation for much longer and I wish we could. We will do it another time, hopefully in Sweden or another, another wonderful spot. Um, but let me just say to you um, for your time today, thank you very much, Kevin. It was extremely enlightening um, for me and for those who are watching. Um, and then thank you also for what International IDEA is doing. I would commend to all who are listening and watching to check out all of what they are doing right now to track COVID's impact on democracy and governance and really looking forward to those opportunities as well as those areas where we all need to be vigilant about. So Kevin, thank you very much. We look forward to welcoming you back to the Hilltop one day um, and just appreciate your time with us today. My pleasure, Nicole. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a joy. I mean, I, I always, uh, I always uh, cherish any opportunity to go back to academia. I mean, I'm an academic at heart and uh, uh, this kind of conversation I, uh, I enjoy enormously. So I, I thank you for having me here and, uh, and hopefully, hopefully uh, we'll see each other in DC and, uh, and in Georgetown, which is a, which is a place that I, I like very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Bye. Take care. Welcome to our conversation today. We've been talking about democracy and human rights broadly. And our conversation today is gonna to focus specifically on a series of freedoms, freedoms of expression, freedom of speech, digital rights, and all that is around how we consume information and, and communicate as a, global, uh, as a global community. My name is Nicole Bibbin Sadak, and I'm the Deputy Director of MSFS, and I'm so thrilled to have two extraordinary thought leaders and practitioners with us today. Let me introduce them, and then we'll jump into our conversation. Abele Akobi is the Director of Public Policy at Facebook for Africa, Middle East, and Turkey, and has been um, an active uh, thought leader and practitioner in the space of, of um, all that is our internet communications and digital rights for some time. She is a member of the Georgetown community already as she's participated in our Global Leadership Seminar, which is a, a premier uh, undertaking to bring thought leaders and practitioners from many different sectors to come together to debate, to discuss, to learn together, um, and really form a community um, that's cultivated by the Institute of the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University to, to connect international leaders around the world. Also with us today is Fariha Aziz. She's an award-winning journalist um, coming originally from Pakistan. She is a, the co-founder of Bolo Bai, which is a civil society organization that's geared towards advocacy, policy, and research in the areas of digital rights and civic responsibility. She too has participated in our global leadership seminar run by the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, and we're thrilled to invite her this year and welcome her as a practitioner in residence in the MSFS program. We know that the free, the open and free flow of information from journalists, citizens, governments is essential to a democratic global order and to the exercise and protection of human rights. I'd love to start with comments from each of you on how you see the importance of the open and free flow of information from your respective positions. So let's start with you, Fariha. How would you characterize the challenges both from a journalist standpoint, as well as an advocate of digital rights for citizens, both before the pandemic and how it's been complicated or challenged by the pandemic. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be a part of this conversation. Um, let me begin by citing a very recent example. So um, over a week ago in Pakistan, um, a statement was put out um, and it was titled uh, Attacks on Women in the Media. And what these journalists and analysts were talking about were specifically discrediting by government officials, um, those who are affiliated with the ruling party. And this is all online. Obviously now it's the era of Twitter diplomacy and everybody's online and giving their opinions, et cetera. And so what they specifically cited and what's been going on is that they, um, their coverage of the pandemic, for instance, 
is being terrorists, they're peddlers of fake news. And this is a, a term, unfortunately, which has got on um, uh, even in Pakistan and, you know, government circles. And so it's not disinformation and misinformation and, um, and a proper discourse on it, but just outright labeling and accusations. Um, and the other thing that they pointed to is a culture of abuse. And so what happens is that even though, uh, let's say, government officials may not directly um, tweet out the abuse, but what happens, uh, happens is, as a result, um, supporters or those who say we're affiliated with the party or do not like their narrative because the journalists have been singled out and discredited, then there's a whole barrage of gender-based abuse. Um, and threats. And so that's something that was pointed out, um, which is holding them back. So they're self-censoring. Um, the, you know, they also some of them have, uh, this has affected their professional duties in terms of putting those, uh, you know, pressing questions to government officials, for instance, or contesting data or narratives, whether it's a pandemic. And not just, so even prior to the pandemic, we've been battling in the online space and otherwise um, censorship, government regulation. Uh, we had a law that was brought in uh, in 2016, a cybercrime law, but under it, just earlier this year, um, you know, the government tabled rules which were very regressive. And so there were comments from, you know, um, you know, it, it, platforms such as Facebook, Google, through the AIC uh, platform, civil society, locally, industry, et cetera. So constantly, and unfortunately during the pandemic, while everything else sort of slowed down, this didn't. Um, and so this had to be combated simultaneously. We're saying, okay, just because there is some misinformation or a health situation or a pandemic does not mean that you use this as an excuse to roll in regressive um, legislation or policies in the name of curbing fake news or disinformation or misinformation, which became another sort of, uh, it was weaponized for this. Uh, what we also saw is contact tracing apps, right? So the privacy about, uh, aspect of it. And so governments also saying, oh, but now we need to collect data. Now we, uh, you know, centralize all of it. So data concerns, privacy concerns were also um, they existed prior to this, but obviously during the pandemic, uh, heightened concerns now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bella, you work for the premier platform that has connected so many people around the world, has given voice and, and opportunity for people to, um, to share their views, to connect with others around the world, and to um, give a platform also for activists and movements to, to spread their information and advocate for causes. And at the same time, it's the one that is under probably the tightest scrutiny <laughs> um, for what is going on um, in the world as far as many of the issues which Fariha just spoke to about information sharing, disinformation. Um, how would you characterize some of those challenges that Facebook um, faced before uh, the pandemic? And if you can speak to how they've been impacted by the, the COVID pandemic. Sure. So I'll, I, I think it's important for me to start by saying that the reason I came to Facebook was specifically because um, my mission or my life's purpose is about reallocation of power. And by that, I mean, we recognize that we live in a world where there are systems of power that privilege certain groups over others. Um, and I, it is uh, my goal, my, my life's mission um, to, to, to do what I can to shift the balance of power and to shift the arc of the universe so that justice is served towards justice. So that's why I'm here. And I'm here specifically because of the power of the platform to do that, the power of the platform to do that and how the power, the pla the power of the platform can be used to undermine those things. We can talk about COVID. I think it's also important to talk about sort of this global um, discovery of racism, which sounds a little um, facetious, but these are all systems that already existed that were exacerbated in some way by COVID. So if I start with COVID, so the fact that our platform, I remember, so when the, when the um, pandemic first started, there was this initial sense that, oh my goodness, everything was going to slow down. For Facebook, for our platforms, it actually has become our most, um, it's the, it has become a crucible for a number of reasons. One, people are home or people were, or many people, I mean, we, we can talk about a global divide in terms of who could stay home and who, who had to go out, but many people were home. Many people were using our platforms to connect. So there's a huge amount of load and a huge amount of responsibility on our platforms. 
there's a huge amount of distrust in terms of um, 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 traditional forms of media, huge amounts mm -hmm. of distrust in terms of um, traditional, you know, wear masks, don't wear masks. And so our platform became a vector for all of those things. So there's a huge, there, so in terms of our platform, what were we doing in terms of stopping um, information that was, or the, the fact that our platform was being used essentially to weaponize misinformation that would lead to worse healthcare outcomes? That became an enormous challenge. There's enormous challenge related to how, how you want to ensure that governments can use the platform to get um, content out, but you also don't want to be in a position where you're being weaponized by certain governments in terms of misinformation that they want to spread. There are also a, a, a number of different ru rumors that were being spread to disenfranchise certain groups. So we had um, a, a spike in hate speech around the pandemic, around um, uh, laying blame for the pandemic and, and certain groups. And in the beginning, there is, there's a, a huge amount of racist invective um, directed towards China. But as the pandemic spread, we started seeing different types of, so groups that were already marginalized were being, were, were starting to be um, mar further marginalized by this. So for example, you saw um, a narratives in India saying that Muslims were the reason why the pandemic was spreading. We saw that around the world. So that was, that, so, so that, that was sort of a, another challenge. There's also a challenge in terms of the way governments, some governments use the pandemic as an opportunity um, to crack down on speech that they were already upset with, but this became sort of, um, this became an opportunity because you could say public health, you could talk about general emergency and all of those pressures then came to bear upon us on a, as a platform. And we may be getting into this, but I do think that it's, it's, it is telling and it was particularly significant that in the middle of this, George Floyd happened. And again, this is something, this, this is something, uh, uh, this is a common day occurrence in the United States, but th there is something about this moment, p potentially because of the pandemic, potentially because you had so much attention on screens, potentially because people weren't going to work. And so this had its own pressures and this had its own, uh, own um, sort of issues for our platform in terms of how people were using the platform to organize, how people were using the platform to mobilize. What's the challenge there in terms of how we engage with law enforcement if people are tr also trying to get data about um, people who are using our platform to organize? I think that gives you just, a, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of challenges that have been exacerbated. All of these things were always underlying issues, but were further exacerbated by both the, the pandemic and, and the, the, the sort of global conversation about racial injustice that ensued. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That gives us that gives us so much to go off of. And, and really, we're talking about COVID, but the issue of, of digital rights and the issue of the free flow of information, as you say, uh, Bele, is, is far beyond just a question of, of COVID. It's a question of um, how do we balance rights and responsibilities around information. Um, can each of you speak to that, that specific point, is how do we continue to um, to connect and ensure that we have uh, um, the free flow of information and whether that's coming from journalists or whether it's citizens sharing it on platforms or whether it's coming from governments um, in, in any, any uh, measure of, of communication, how do we balance that with this question of disinformation? What are the specific issues that we need to be thinking about the limits to put in place or the opportunities to take advantage of that will, will allow us both to have that free flow of information, but also um, combat what is unquestionably the misuse of um, the misuse of government power, the misuse of platforms by governmental and non-governmental and individuals that are seeking to uh, advance an agenda which is not aligned with universal standards. And Faria, maybe if you want to start, and then we'll get to Abele. So um, it's it's tricky, right? Because even universal standards, obviously, with the pandemic, um, things have been developing and still are. And so, initially, a week ago, what we, in, during the initial days, what we believed to be true was obviously um, there were other theories or other scientific facts that had to be taken into account. And so, it was in very real time. You had to make. Uh, inform yourselves, make decisions, um, and put that out. And inform the free flow of information should essentially enable citizens to um, inform themselves and come up with views. And so obviously there is a fine line between government mandating certain things 
um, and also, uh, you know, uh, but you want, I mean, for example, whether it's masks, et cetera, I know this has been a lot of conversation about, oh, but our right to wear or not to wear. Um, and so it's again, in terms of individual and collective rights, and that's obviously, that's all throughout history, that's always been um, a balance that needs to be struck. And so I do believe that in striking that balance, what we do need is, again, access to information, but on a critical lens and question anybody in authority as well. Because the thing is that we might seem to think that some governments have this bona fide or some organizations in terms of saying, okay, well, they're doing a better thing or you know, they're better informed or the strategies or um, grappling with it. However, questioning, uh, one way or the other is not to be uh, put down because we need to uh, question their narrative. And so when, for example, my issue, like from a local perspective, right? So our uh, federal government and the state level, the province that I'm in, the state I'm in, have been at odds with each other. That presents a different problem because um, there's no coherent national narrative. Now, I'm not saying that there should be a hegemonic narrative, which is actually what journalists are pushing back against. Because, and then the other problem is what happens is that when the platforms step in to say, OK, we're going to regulate or flag certain information, whose version are they going to take into account? Um, you know, if it's the federal government or the, and the obviously who's um, you know, communicating with them, but the provincial government might have the better approach in terms of how they're approaching all of this or what citizens are saying, right? Like we're saying, populist governments are using this as a regulatory tool, as um, an opportunity to roll in certain laws, et cetera, and to uh, try and keep certain information away from citizens. And so all of that is then being done on social media. The questions are being raised there because that's the only access that a lot of people have. And we've seen that through the weaponization there in different jurisdictions, there have been arrests, not like they didn't happen before, but COVID presented another opportunity. Something I think we're all uh, really familiar with is uh, this in the context of a national security paradigm, right? Where there becomes this discourse becomes hegemonic and we're told no, but you must suspend your certain rights because this takes precedence. And so I think similarly, uh, the pandemic is being presented as one such thing where, okay, well, you know, we must suspend certain rights because this is more pressing and we need to um, account or we need to, uh, you know, uh, basically face this um, and we can't do that. So that's always something to be wary of. Um, where when governments do that or any majoritarian consensus is not necessarily always a good thing. And that's something to be wary of as well. So I think um, what really is required is also, uh, because this is happening so um, fast, mechanisms to check, mechanisms to receive information, to put out information, to fact check, verify, et cetera, those need to catch up a little bit as well. Um, and that's something, unfortunately, that's been a conversation in the policy circles and the tech circles for a very long time. Unfortunately, it doesn't, I mean, and this is not a settled question to date, but um, the more that we have, reg, uh, you know, self-help check mechanisms, um, it also pushes back a little bit against governments trying to assert even more control or majoritarian sort of groups trying to um, push one particular view. Excellent. Abela. So I'll start by saying, I think it's important to talk about access. We have, and so the extent to which the, the pandemic has moved a lot of information online, a lot of discourse online, a lot of um, jobs online, the extent to which we have parts of the world across Africa, across Asia, across Latin America, that are disconnected from the internet, um, right. it, it it, uh, I, th it's, I think it's important to note the extent to which that means that people are further disenfranchised um, because of the high cost of data. So I think that's important to, 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 to note. From a Facebook perspective, if I talk about, if I just want to talk about some of the ways in which we try to address some of those challenges, which I have to admit are, are bigger than Facebook and we are on a journey, but we're nowhere where I think where we want to be. So we recognize the extent to which our platforms were being used. So we created dedicated teams and tools to try and push back on misinformation. We created a new policy in response to, so that we could remove claims of cures because before that was something that, that, that could stay on the platform. We tried to create classifiers um, so that we could find when old images had been misused and take those, that misinformation off. 
we created um, a relationship with third party fact checkers and digital literacy. Those are those are uh, those are approaches. There, again, this this really requires a more of a holistic approach and a holistic conversation. And there's, there's something there. It was clear in, in in the middle of this, and it continues to be clear how important uh, supporting science is. Um, and so, see when you see supporting science and support and supporting belief in science. And yes, it is. And it's interesting because there are ways in which the scientific community has been used to support rumors or things that are not true but if you think about a lot of what are the issue a lot of the issues around misinformation they boil down to not just that people aren't exposed to, to, to data but that there has been a fundamental mistrust of traditional forms of of um not just of media, but tradi traditional forms of, 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 um, of in traditional institutions. So there's a sense that nobody's right, so everybody could be right. And I mean, if you, this, if you look at the, the, all of the debate around vaccines, you know, that has been building up and has build, build, been building up, it's spilling over into now where an, epi epidemiologist, an epidemiologist can tell you something, someone who has a PhD in this subject can tell you something, but then you are more likely, to, people are more likely to believe their aunt Dottie um, who read something um, that she got in her WhatsApp group that someone sent them on Google. I mean, and that is, and I think that's, and so this sense that um, we need to reinvest in science is, it has, 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 has become really, really clear. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more on that point. We will we'll have a number of scientists who will be joining us conversation over time just to look at many of these issues through a scientific lens as well. Um, let me uh, turn the conversation a bit to thinking about what do these questions mean differently, if they are in fact different, in democratic societies and authoritarian or non-democratic societies. Because I sense that there, there, while there is an overlap in the challenge of disinformation or misinformation, um, to some extent it looks different in those societies where it is, where the government has a significant control and has already been systematically um, limiting access to information or systematically putting out a narrative which is not necessarily true or respectful of, 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 of rights. Whereas in democratic societies where there has been a greater respect for rights, the challenge is much more a citizen based one with some governmental, um, with some governmental overlay. I would love to hear how you're thinking um, whether there is actually that differentiation between the two communities um, or the two types of government and how we approach those differently, albeit in, in some places with some overlap. For yeah, maybe we'll start with Annabelle. Sure. So I think this um, division also now needs to be reconsidered um, in the wake of you know, populist governments around the world. Um, so, you know, earlier how the world was divided into the global south and these are these Western democracies that you look up to. And clearly um, all of that over the last couple of years has shifted phenomenally. So I think what we should look out for are markers of autocratic tendencies which do exist irrespective of which part of the world that you're located in. Um, and secondly, um, you know, democracy also, but is democracy only about the mechanics of a system? Um, you know, because we also then have to take into account what I've been saying, majoritarian, uh, you know, consensus and how that consensus, as so to speak, is even developed. Or is it something that we tend to assume? Or is it just the number of votes that get you elected into a particular public office or in assemblies? And this is something that we're also talking about here. So is that enough to then start reversing what um, you know, the constitution lays out in terms of rights, laws that are protective versus just because you've been voted in or are in power, does that mean that then you can start rolling back and changing and introducing laws which are clearly, clearly, and at least I'll speak in our context, um, undemocratic or unconstitutional. Um, and so obviously to fight these laws, then you require court challenges, um, but you can at least web that narrative and that no, something's quite off. So I think that fundamental lens and that needs to change now, especially what we've seen happening all over the world, um, that conversation, we're, we're equal participants in that, right? And we've um, been, uh, you know, in 10 years, me being in the tech circle or policy spaces or having, okay, but let's look at, you know, from a speech point of view. Um, and I would say that, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the First Amendment, but there's also, a, and, you know, we need to recognize First Amendment doesn't exist world over. 
there are certain peculiarities, there are certain context based uh, requirements um, in different jurisdictions. So now in this world, I mean, earlier references used to be, oh, don't be like China, don't be like Russia, don't be like this. Right now we're also saying, okay, but don't also be like the US or the Trump administration for a lot of things, right? And not only just now, um, you know, the, the, what we forget is that we need to make an assessment of governments um, over a period of time. So those who seem more politically correct doesn't over the years doesn't mean that the issues were not fizzling or those things didn't exist. Like you mentioned, racism is not an issue of today, right? It's always been around. The structural inequality has always been around. Our, in Pakistan's context, class-based systems have always been around power differentials. Sometimes they're more pronounced or sometimes um, you know, you need one trigger and then everything bursts, right? Because um, it's been uh, festering for so long, unaddressed by those who seemed relatively more democratic. Um, so I think those are the conversations now to have, especially, um, and we shouldn't have a very clear um, division between what's a democracy, what's not a democracy, um, and how we view democracy also. Yeah, I just I just wanted to underline that very uh, even further. Um, when I remember being at Yahoo, and there was all, when I because I headed the human rights uh, program, and there was always this push to say, can we please let's have a list of like of good countries? I mean, they wouldn't call it good countries, but good countries and then bad countries, and you have different rules. And I, I always pushed back against that. And what I find so the moment we're in now is horrifying in many ways, but I find it quite clarifying because mm -hmm. it's made obvious what has always been the case. So the US, which has put itself out as the greatest democracy, is a country that was built in the systematic structural disenfranchisement of people. So it was built, the foundation, the constitution was created um, by saying that human beings were three fifths of a human being. People, when Americans went to fight, went to fight, fight for liberation in the first and second world wars, they went with armies that were segregated and the black people went back home to come to countries that didn't allow them full humanity. That has ever been the case, even past the civil rights movement. There has, the United States has always been separate and unequal. And so the notion that there, that the, that there is a democracy or that there is a country, and, and usually it's the United States that puts itself in this position, that is a democracy and so there should be, a, and so things work in a certain way in this perfect democracy, that has never been the case. And so the one thing I find gratifying is that that's now very clear, it should be very clear to everyone. And so it, so going back to the question about, what, about how you treat uh, countries differently, in the context of the US, and so yes, you, do, you don't have a place where the government tightly controls the narrative, but what is happening is you see confusion, you see mass confusion. So you don't have, for example, the government controlling some networks, but you see a very deliberate attempt to poison the narrative. And so what you have is not one controlled narrative, but you have multiple and you have multiple. And the effect that that has on the population is it engenders complete distrust because the sense is that all of these different narratives could be true. I don't know. And so your Aunt Dottie could be right. The your Aunt Dottie has exactly the same standing as the head of the CDC. And that is, in my view, is quite deliberate. And so, um, so yes, it is different than if you have an authoritarian regime where you have one newspaper and you know the internet is shut down. But the impact is still, the impact is still incredibly um, destructive on, 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 um, on democracy, if you want to name it democracy, on, on public health. Um, and, all, and all the types of decision making that you need um, that you, that needs to happen in order to keep people safe. Excellent. Let me just ask, where, where are the points and the opportunities to push back on exactly that dangerous confusion that is sowed into society when we do have this leveling of Aunt Dottie and the CDC um, of of having a similar uh, a similar level of expertise how what are the what are the key opportunities that we have now or do they come do they come from governments do they come from non-governmental organizations do they come from social media companies do they come from the united nations to push back collectively on this to um to ensure that we both remain open and free but we also have um a, a standard of integrity and a standard of of truth um, that we can that we can look to in this in this um, in this context. Let me start with Abele and then go to Fariha on this. 
I mean, so I think every function, every sector of society has a role to play. I actually find it, um, I think the moment that you have government institutions, and I'm not saying government as, as it's currently um, created where there's a huge amount of inequality within it, but in the, morning, the moment you have collective institutions completely undermined, I think you're left with nothing as a society. So I do think that it's critical that government, that there be a sense that government is something that is created by people, for people and works for people and needs to be focused on what's for the, the common good. There's also a role for platforms like Facebook. And here, the, the beauty of Facebook is that you can work there and you can, and dissent is, is, is okay. And so I feel very strongly that as a platform, it is not possible for us to say that we are neutral. And that doesn't mean that we have turned into a publisher. That doesn't mean that we've turned into government. And I actually think that putting um, too much responsibility for a privately owned platform, putting too many government. So I, for example, I don't think a world in which Facebook is the, is, is the, is the source of health information is the only sort that's not, that's not a good world. No one has elected Facebook to do anything. So, so that world is a, is a bad world in my view, but we do as an actor and as, and as the more power you have, the more responsibility you have. So in my view, as a platform, we cannot be neutral. So the same way we, we, we started saying, no, we're going to label, you know, misinformation related to health. There are a lot of conversations where as a company, you have to say, do you exist as an actor within a society or a community? And if you are, then should you be dedicated to sort of the general good? And if you're dedicated to the general good, that means that you make decisions that are not value free and that are not mm -hmm. neutral. And so they may be decisions about the kind of information you allow on the platform. They may be decisions about the kind of content that you that you take down. And that may bother a lot of people. And I, you know, people talk about the First Amendment. I just want to be clear: First Amendment does not apply to companies. The company, you know, the company is not a state or a government actor. And so I do think that there, there are decisions that companies or platforms like ours will have to make that are that are that are connected to values that may, to the outside observer, um, look as if we are taking a side. So, I, so and I do think, and I do think that that is something that will become increasingly more and more of a responsibility for for platforms like ours. Excellent, Fariha. Absolutely, I think um, everybody has their part to play in this, right? Um, and we can't uh, look to any one actor to do it. Obviously, governments um, have certain responsibilities, um, and how they exercise their functions and powers. I feel has to be within certain limitations, which I find at least here are flouted too often, right? Um, and there's not enough questioning or there's also an over-reliance on the government. And now what we see in the digital sphere uh, on platforms to do much of it, outsourcing a lot of decision-making to them, which actually society also needs to, citizens also need to play an active part in, right? Um, and so the conflation is also really easy in terms of narrative conflations, uh, which I find quite alarming. And we've seen um, all around that discourse or discussion or rationale um, is, not, is usually met with, and these are terms that we're using, there's deflection, there's what about re, there are false equivalences. Um, and uh, that makes it really, really difficult um, you know, as discourse is developing. The other thing is also that it's not the resources when somebody in government says that there's far more visibility, when something's on the platform or when platforms are making certain decisions. So um, like you mentioned that there's no, so the First Amendment does not apply to companies. The conversation in digital rights sphere is, uh, is also that what about when companies make decisions? So whether it's even based on community guidelines or their rules, enforcement of this requires some sort of editorialization, right? Their user speech is still being affected. So what do you do about that? I mean, obviously there have been concerns about more transparency, more qualification of how you reach those decisions, right? Um, what drives them? Also speaking uh, back to what earlier was, uh, you know, described as values. So what are the values that a government, a society, a company wants to uphold? Here again, I feel like we assume, okay, because this is a value that we've espoused. What is, how do we come to agree on that as a value or something and what drives that value? I think right now the time is ripe to ha go back to fundamentals of um, re-examining and reassessing what we held to be true, what we held to be useful in terms of values, our notions, et cetera. 
Not to say that plunge ourselves even in, in more of an abyss of complete confusion um, and misinformation, because there is a lot of that that we're um, you know dealing with as well. The last point I do want to flag though is resources and access, right? Um, so uh, this is something that's coming up with respect to platform manipulation, as we um, call it, right? And going back to the statement that I referenced, right, where there's, there's this equivalence where, okay, but, you know, when we say the government official is saying something that is incorrect and needs to be rectified, it's falsely conflated with, oh, but so are these journalists or individuals they're not on the same level in terms of there's a power differential over there. Mm. Um, so the visibility that the government has and the power that the government wields in terms of legislative rule making policy making is disproportionate to what a media organization or an individual journalist um, holds. And so also to then conflate that, oh, but look how they use certain types of language. So shouldn't they? So these, I think, going back to understanding how power works in our society, the differences, the dynamics, um, that conversation needs to be had as well. Because information, how it's accessed, how it's propagated, has a lot to do with who has more resources to put something out. And that's something that fundamentally we need to also be very aware of. Excellent. I want to draw a couple threads together here and return to Abele's first comment about the awakening that um, that is happening in the United States, but certainly around the world about um, uh, massive disparity in access to things like justice, like healthcare, like education. And it does go to your point, Fariha, about um, about power dynamics. And if you could just speak each of you briefly in the context of, of your respective um, both professions, but also countries um, of what does that look like for those who have either systematically over time or those who are newly vulnerable, and I hear I'm thinking of refugee populations or others, but for those who have been disconnected from their rights or who have been denied those rights or have been systematically dis disadvantaged, what does this debate that we're, or this discussion that we're having today look like particularly for those communities and, and, and the need to uh, amend how we think about the inclusiveness of those communities. Abele, let's start with you and then, and then move to Fariha. Um, so I would say a couple things. So one, um, and I can talk about it, when often when we're thinking about things like hate speech, for example, mm -hmm. we're not thinking about the systems of power behind that. So I'll give you, so, so if we're thinking about groups who have historically been disenfranchised, and who are newly starting to assert rights, there's a way in which they are going to need to express themselves and there's a way in which they're going to need to com communicate that will come up against rules that are created around hate speech or rules that are created um, around, so I'll give you an example. So uh, if you put right on Facebook, um, men are trash, that because you know uh, gender sex is a protected ca category and then you put something against it that's derogatory that's something that would come down if you say are in or if you are a, a refugee population and you want to talk about um say you're or not you're, and you want to talk about disenfranchisement of land for example and you want to say this particular group stole our land this could actually be factual but because of the rules we have around hate speech and around um, negative characteristics, that would be the type of speech that comes down. We mm. know that groups and people are using our platforms to communicate. And we know that there is an even greater need for people to have access to platforms to, commun to communicate. If that is happening, and at the same time, we're not thinking about what systems of power are behind it, what ends up happening is that we, uh, everyone has the same penalty but the impact of it is that the, the, the systems of power that currently exist are strengthened because they have nothing to complain about, right? Sure. But the people who are trying to use the platform to communicate, they are mm -hmm. shut down and that's their, only, that's their only platform. And so that has been, I think that's a hard problem. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a necessary problem for us to grapple with because the end result, if we don't grapple with it as a platform, and I'm talking, I, you know, I work at Facebook, but this is relevant for any platform, is, it, is that you are supporting a system of power that exists 
by not taking into consideration the fact that there are differentials of power and that there are different ways that people need to communicate. I mean, the perfect example is, would the ANC have been able to use our platforms? No, they wouldn't have, right? They wouldn't have been able to. And so is that the side of history that we want to be on? Or, or do it conversely, do we want to be on the side of history where the state is given more voice than, than, than citizens or individuals. So I would say those are some of the hard um, problems that platforms and companies like ours have to grapple with and that are becoming more and more relevant because there are so many more people who are wanting to give voice to ancient um, inequities. Excellent, excellent. Fariha. Absolutely, and I just want to uh, continue basically what Abel is, and then this is something we uh, see play out on a daily basis, right? Um, uh, who's in power, how they use that power. So for instance, um, we had women marches some time ago. Um, and obviously gender and sexuality is actually a more recently discussed topic um, mm -hmm. because of the conservatism and everything that uh, is related to, you know, culture and religion and society. And so the backlash has been, you know, attacks, threats, abuse and uh, i find it interesting where a lot of people responded with but and I, i'm talking about reasonably let's say educated people same circles corporate circles perhaps say well why can't they be a little more polite about it and your resistance over history um has not and it's okay not to be polite because there's an aggressor it's um you know your rights have been trampled upon you have not um, have been given an equal status, whether on the basis of your gender, your race, ethnicity, or just fundamentally your humanity has been denied, as Pele also pointed out earlier. And so there's going to be rage and there's going to be, you know, harsh comments, etc. So there's one part of it where you have to understand the power dynamics, right? Then our ability to express ourselves. We have only now social media, especially in countries where state controlled media does not right. provide that avenue, right? Um, but what happens is that when you express yourself on social media, um, not only um, as you know, comments like men are trash, et cetera, get removed, we're also seeing this um, you know, play out in a regional context. So let's say Kashmir, for instance, right? And yes. it's been a very hot thing. So uh, India, Pakistan, Kashmir, um, earlier we used to talk about a borderless internet. We know that's not true anymore. As companies enter markets, as local laws apply, um, so it's about um, market um, dynamics as well and how to, um, you know, uh, competing sort of laws, etc. So a lot of people who were posting about, let's say, Kashmir, uh, for instance, in Pakistan found that their comments were reported um, or removed, etc. On Twitter also, so even when the state, you know, sends a request, so Twitter historically um, for some time has not removed content from Pakistan, right, and has no local presence. However, what we're seeing is, um, in terms of manipulation, that a lot of, so using the Twitter rules, um, old tweets are reported against the rules, you know, which were quite innocuous, or for blood donation, some number was put out with consensus. This happens a lot in Pakistan, you know, blood donation drives, contact this person, they need information. Now, Twitter has a no personal information privacy rule. And so they go and report it against that. And these, this is deliberately done at a time when somebody is, you know, um, talking about an arrest of somebody that is not being covered on mainstream media. And they, found that they find themselves suspended and, you know, from the platform for days when that activism is just, you know, and that narrative um, is to make sure that those in power hear them and they find themselves removed. So this also when platform, so the power differential here is that even if let's say it's not a government request per se, the government has more resources to allocate people to specifically respond to these things. We're talking about today, social media wings of political parties, et cetera. So I, as an individual, don't have the time to go looking into the accounts and profiles of people, but people who are dedicated to do justice and are paid to do justice, whether it's um, you know, on a government payroll or otherwise, that's disproportionate. So their volume of requests uh, versus what I can do as an individual is disproportional. And this also, I feel now needs to be um, uh, addressed because this is also about, um, you know, stifling of speech and access to information, which otherwise should be available to people. Could I underline a piece yeah. in there, just because I think it's important to bring out. So there's a piece that is about, what the, you know, the content that uh, is 
you know, taken down because it's against rules. There's also a whole conversation about what um, we might not take down, but we might think of as the goal of the internet. So there are a lot of conversations around like civil discourse. And, I, and this, it brought up when, when Farid was talking about, um, you know, the kind of discourse we want. So even putting aside slurs, or putting, but, but there's a notion that, you know, what we really want is when people are engaging on the internet for just to be civil, you know, for, because that, that the world we want is civil. And it reminds me of one of my, one of, I have many favorite quotes. One of my favorite ones is Frederick Douglass, power gives up nothing without a fight. It never has and it never will. And so mm. knowing that that is a fact, so it mm. is a fact. So, so to then have civility be a goal of discourse, mm. you are right there saying, we are creating a space where power is supported, where existing power is supported. And so it just, it, it is something even as, because outside of Facebook, there's always this conversation like, oh my gosh, it's so, you know, these conversations are just so hard. And, and so shouldn't Facebook or Twitter be creating a space where we have civil discourse? And that's the thing that I always remember, civil discourse, at, there is no movement, there's no right that has ever been won, you know, over a cup of tea, speaking politely, right? Like. That's just not, it, it's not, it's not a thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's an excellent point. Um, we could have this conversation for a long time, but I'm respectful of, uh, of your time and schedule. So let me just um, ask one last question. Um, the COVID pandemic, the conversations around discrimination and race and justice in the world, um, and the, the, foundational shaking of the international order have all um, given us a tremendous amount of concern about the world, but it's also opened up some opportunities because we're all doing things differently than we've ever done them before. And we're showing ourselves that maybe things are possible that we had not thought um, were possible before. And part of what we want to do in this series with our students is force them to think what could look different and what are the values, back to the point made earlier, what are the values upon which that reshaped world can look? Um, what are some of those opportunities that each of you see um, coming out of this time? Obviously, we don't know when COVID will, will end, but what, what are some things that we can and should be looking forward to as opportunities to take advantage of? Go with Fariha and then Abele and then, and then close our time. So it's certainly a distressing time, but it's also a moment and time that we're living in where obviously the world, the way it existed is not viable. It's not okay. It's denied a lot of people their right to do. And that's the conversation to have now. Um, this is not going to be easy. Nobody has all the answers, but I think we should definitely seek to ask questions, question ourselves as well. Um, and any established sort of norms, values, um, and see how can we now, so it's, some of it might even be offensive. These are not going to be easy conversations, whether they're had privately or publicly or in classrooms or outside. Um, but I think there needs to be an openness to engage in that kind of discourse. Otherwise, uh, we're not going to get where we should. We, we're not going to begin addressing and understanding um, and so how we understand the world and the world's changed. I mean, the pandemic has changed a lot of things and it's what um, Abele was saying, exasperated a lot of things. And so a lot of things have coincided together. Mm -hmm. And so clearly, and uh, one thing to um, remember is that it's not as if these things did not exist earlier. It would be, you know, our mistake to think. It's just that it's so visible now. And I think in a way, it's good that it's out there, it's visible so that we start addressing it. Because um, what I, you know, last point in our um, sort of context is that for me, if it's an, if a government, let's say, does something outright, I feel that's a better thing than when it's cloaked in this insidiousness of it's democratic, um, but also, um, you know, things are being changed slowly and gradually when things are stark so okay you're, you've shut down something at least i know what you've done and i can call you out for exactly that it's the insidiousness on the the other part that actually scares me more so let us be out with exactly what it is have those conversations and i'm hoping that we can salvage something as we go forward excellent i'm sorry to say two things so one what has struck me is how many impossible things have become possible. And if you start from something like, so I live in London 
is impossible that there would ever be, that I live close to Heathrow, there's always planes. And so for, I think a month, now I, there were no planes, there were no planes. That was an impossible thing. No, I'm not getting into sort of, of course, there's a huge amount of economic uh, uh, consequences that come with that, but that was in and of itself was considered an impossible thing. When they took overhead flight uh, um, images of places in Asia, but and you didn't see pollution because everything had stopped. These are all things that were considered impossible. And so this moment where the impossible, impossible things are happening, this is a moment to imagine what is possible, like reevaluate what truly is impossible versus what, especially given what, if we're looking at things like climate change, if we're looking at inequity, a lot of these things that we've said, no, it will never happen, it's possible. So I think that now is the moment to, to reimagine that. And the second piece is really around solidarity. It has been, an incredible thing to see people marching for Black Lives Matter in Lagos, in Brazil, in Germany, in Amsterdam, all of these different places. And, and there's something around understanding that all of these movements are connected. So all of these movements around rights, all of these movements around reimagining equity and sharing of power are think they're not separate movements. And so this notion that we could look at each other and say, wait a minute, this is the same struggle. Until, until everybody's free, nobody's free. And so this moment, in my view, this is an incredibly exciting moment, which if we step into it, if we step into the uncertainty of it and imagine that, imagine a world where power actually is more equitably um, shared, that to me is the possibility that presents itself in this moment. That's, that's wonderful. It's wonderful. I'm reminded our students have four core values of creativity, service, ethics, and leadership. And the creativity one is the one I always get questions about. But to me, it is our ability to look at the world as it is today and to fundamentally reimagine it, to fundamentally believe that there can be a world without significant environmental damage, to believe that there is a world in which there is not inequality or that poverty is eradicated and to have that creativity to really believe that the world could look different because those who were came before us 100 years ago had to imagine it and they moved the ball forward and now we have a tremendous opportunity to do exactly the same and the question is whether we will capture that moment. Um, I wish that we could have this conversation for two more hours at least all sitting in the same room, but um, I want to thank each of you for taking the time on zoom to do it the way we have today. Um, it's been extraordinarily enlightening and a huge service to our students. So thank you both for the work that you're doing in your respective spheres, but certainly for taking the time today to share your very insightful thoughts. Um, thank you on behalf of, of Georgetown University and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Those were challenging words and also strands of optimism about what opportunities are emerging. We're seeing governments take extraordinary action during this time. What are the standards by which we will determine what is really a threat to democracy or democratic values and what are needed actions in a time of crisis and pandemic? Will um, democracy emerge stronger globally? Or will this period be marked by the assertion of irreversible gains by non-democratic forces, both within democracies and those existing in authoritarian run countries? On a global stage, what role will democratic values play and which entities and actors will play a role in reversing or undermining those values? We hope you will have a rich and rigorous discussion about these and many other questions.